Okay, so I think we're all ready now for our keynote speaker here today. I had the great privilege to meet this lovely lady, very inspiring lady, a couple of weeks ago in Sligo, during Science Week, and they organized a showing of a film called A Plastic Ocean, okay? And um, I met Joe, and Joe is the producer of this film called A Plastic Ocean. Um, Joe used to work for the BBC, um, taking underwater footage, so she used to be diving underneath the water. And she used to work with the Blue Planet team. Did you ever hear of the Blue pa Planet, the documentaries? Yes, with David Attenborough, really special, wasn't it? So Joe used to work with them, and it was during one of a trip, there was an expedition to the Pacific Ocean and they came upon an area in the Pacific Ocean where there was loads of plastic waste. And it is known as the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. The same Great Pacific Garbage Patch and the Plastic Ocean that St. Clair told you about earlier on. So we all know about this. But Jo saw it firsthand. And it was such a big problem that she felt she needed to make a documentary about this. I saw the film, and literally, when the film, uh, when it was finished showing, the whole audience was quiet for about five minutes because we were in shock because we couldn't actually believe what we'd just seen. It's a fantastic documentary. So, first of all, I can't recommend highly enough that when it comes out in January, release at the end of January, that you all download it and watch it, okay? But at the end of the film, and we had questions and answers, and I ended up going down to Joe and I said, well, thanks very much for showing that. I'm so impressed, I learned so much. Um, any chance you're free on the 6th of December? And Joe being, I think, I might say, we only know each other very little, but probably as mad as me, said, yeah, I think I can fix that. So she flew in from Bristol this morning to be here with you here today. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce you to Joe. So please, guys, okay, please, guys, I want a big boule bus after she has spoken. When she's speaking, I need you all to be quiet as mice, okay? So I'll hand you over to Joe now. Thank you so much for that introduction. It's actually my pleasure to come here and talk to you. Um, you are the most important people on the planet right now because the mess we're in, I probably won't be here long enough to see it through, to see it changing, and to turn it back to how it was when I was your age. And I'm going to tell you some of the things you can do, but just know that you from now on are going to be ocean ambassadors, and I'm going to be relying on you. So I wanted to, to make this, I'm just wondering if we can turn off the front lights, is that at all possible? Just to be able to see the screen a little bit better. First thing I'm going to do is take you back to the 1950s, a time even before I was born, to show you the kind of adverts we had in our newspapers. Now, in those days, your doctor and your dentist was telling you to smoke because it was good for you. Even if you had asthma, there was a special cigarette just for you. Now, we all know now just how crazy that is, don't we? But at the same time, this came out telling us that plastic was disposable. And what I think is crazy is that we still believe that. We still act as if it is. When plastic defies nature, it doesn't break down, it's indestructible, and yet we're all still believing that we can use it once and throw it away. And these are the kind of things I'm thinking about, and some of these I'm sure you'll have used in your time, and all completely unnecessary for single use. <clears throat> so where is a way? You kind of think, yeah, I've used it, I've thrown it away. Some people think away is recycling. That's probably the best they can do. Only about 13% of plastic is recycled, and the rest either ends up in landfills or thrown out into the environment. And because all our streets are designed to take rainwater away, plastic's very light, and it has a very, very easy journey to drains, to rivers, to canals, and straight out into the ocean. Now what happens to the animals? They don't understand plastic because plastic defies nature. And they're all very inquisitive. And I can imagine there might have been some nice tasty sandwiches in this bag. And in went the bird to try and get them. 
You've all heard about the albatross and how the parents are feeding them plastic from the ocean instead of, instead of um, squid and fish. What I've got here is a bag of plastic. All of that came from one baby bird on Midway Island in the Hawaiian Islands. And all of the things in this bag were also found in the stomach of chicks. We've even got a printer cartridge in here, a couple of cigarette lighters, toothbrushes, all sorts. If there's time afterwards you want a close look at these, just do come up and see me. Everything you see there was in one single albatross chick. That was an, a 90 day old chick. So you can see what the poor parents have been feeding it. The chicks are dying with their stomachs full um, and yet they've starved to death. Now this is an interesting one. This, little, this is a snapping turtle and she was found in a river. She was rescued by an, a 12 year old boy who continued to dive down and pick her up. What she'd done as a tiny hatchling was to go through the little ring. If you take off the lid of your plastic bottle, there's a ring around it. Someone had just thrown that away. It ended up in the river and she swam into it. When they found her, they x-rayed her and there was no shell underneath that thing. So it was that strong. They took it off and uh, she's doing okay now. So you probably all know about what turtles like to eat. Jellyfish, that's right. And you think about a plastic bag floating in the water, what does it look like? Exactly. So turtles, unfortunately, when they start eating them, once it starts to go down, they can't throw it up. They can throw up liquid, but not solids. So this poor turtle looks like it's eaten a bin liner and it's had to go all the way through the stomach. Now what happens is it often blocks the gut, so the turtles can't eat anymore and they can't get rid of the food that they've got. And that's one way that they die. And a very high percentage of turtles, not just eating plastic bags, but picking up little bits of plastic as well. Now what happens is a lot of the plastic gets into the oceans, but in some countries they don't have their rubbish collected like we do. And they see the river as an ever-cleansing place to get rid of the trash from their villages. This was taken in Indonesia. This is these kids' backyard. They've never seen a clean river, and this is them playing. Now, if we're not careful, if we don't get this under control now, this is what our rivers are going to look like in your lifetimes. And that's why it's so important that we stop and that you become ambassadors. This is the end of one of those rivers, also in Indonesia. And of course, it all backs up. And that's what it's like. Now, at the moment, we're making 300 million tons of plastic a year. Half of that will only be used once and 8 million tons is getting into the oceans. In 1961, when I was on this planet, the total production for the whole planet was 8 million tons. And that shows in a short space of time, all the plastic we were producing then is what goes in every year. Now we're producing 300 million tons. You see, we're at a tipping point, it's got to stop. So once plastic gets out into the ocean, it starts to break up and break up because of sunlight, wave action, and, and sea salt. And it gets picked up by giant currents. And everywhere on the planet is affected by these. There's five major currents, we call them gyres. And they're driven by the way the Earth moves and the winds that result in it. And all of these will collect the stuff from the river mouths and concentrate it in their centers. Now, I was told about the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, and this is the ship that I went on. It looks a bit like a pirate ship. It was almost as much fun. Uh, but I was on that for a month, and we went out. And that picture is actually taken at the center of the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. Now, what you'll notice is that not an awful lot of plastic. There were a few bits around, but I was expecting this solid island. What we did, remember I told you that the plastic breaks into smaller and smaller pieces takes about 20 years to get to the center, and I thought, well, it floats or it sinks, let's see what's on the surface. So we put these nets in, and what we found, 400 miles into our journey, little bits of plastic as we poured the nets through a sieve, but that was nothing, because the closer we got to the center, the worse it got. So in the centers of the oceans, when you drag a net through what looks clear, that's what you're looking at, and it's absolutely chocker with little pieces of plastic. Now, the trouble with plastic when it's that small, it's the same size as plankton, that's right. The fish can't tell the difference. The plankton can't tell the difference either. And you can see the one over there, it's the um, green bits have been labeled, that's plastic. So it'll eat its own food, but it eats plastic just as much. So obviously, 
animals that feed on plankton are going to be at risk and animals that feed on fish are also going to be at risk of eating the plastic. And you might think, well, we eat the fish, we don't eat their guts, so it doesn't really matter. But the trouble is there's a lot of chemicals in the ocean that have gone in over years of industry and agriculture that plastic just attracts. They just love plastic. And when they're eaten, these, these chemicals, what they like better than plastic is fat. So if a fish eats it, they float off and they go into its fatty layers. And these are things that have been associated with all sorts of problems and all sorts of disease. So we need to make sure that we stop letting that plastic get into the ocean, otherwise we're going to be poisoning our food chain. And we've still got time. Now, I said plastic either floats or it sinks. When we were making the film, we wanted to see what the seabed was like. So we chartered this little mini-sub, and we put it down randomly. We knew there were some places where there was a lot of plastic, but we couldn't get out to that because the weather was so bad. So we thought, right, if we launch the sub here, what are we going to find? And sure enough, we found plastic everywhere the sub went. Mediterranean. I'm going to show you another sequence now. You've, you've all heard about the albatross. This is a lady that works on the albatross, and she was the one that gave me these. But she also works on these little birds, and this is a species that we get here as well, and it's called a shearwater. I'm going to show you a sequence from the film. I'm going to warn you, it's a little bit graphic, so if anyone's squeamish, you've got to shut your eyes towards the end. When I go like that, you can shut your eyes. Um, but I'll show you that piece now. That gives you an idea. Now, all of the birds that you saw on that table were exactly the same. We opened up 10 of them, and all of them were full of plastic. And it's a problem that's occurring throughout the oceans. I'm not saying all seabirds are like that. It depends on the currents. It depends the type of food the parents are feeding them. But it's, it's estimated now that 90% of all seabirds are being fed plastic by their parents. So we need to put a stop to that. Now, this is a tiny island in the Pacific called Tuvalu. They are importing uh, goods for their supermarkets, and whatever they bring into the island is wrapped in plastic. They didn't start doing this until the late 70s. Everything was fine until then. But because they're importing it, you look at that island, where are you going to put all the plastic waste? Well, there, it's, it's a beautiful Pacific island, but unfortunately, this is what their homes are like. They just have nowhere to put it. And what they do is they burn it. Now, if you burn plastic, it gives off poisonous gas. And there was so much sickness in that village. We filmed a family of 30 people, and six had cancer, and two had died of cancer in the previous 18 months because they're breathing it in. And this is because it's believed that plastic is disposable when it's not. So, what can we do about it? Every one of you can do something. Every one of you can make a difference. You've all heard about the microbeads. You might be a bit too young to be using facial scrubs, but if you've got elder sisters and mums and cousins and things like that, tell them to check the contents, because most of the time they're rubbing little plastic beads into their skin. Here's one you can all do, straws. Next time you go into a restaurant or a cafe and you ask for a drink, if you're saying, I'd like an orange juice, no straw, please. Just get the no straw in, because if you forget, you can almost guarantee they'll, they'll put one in your drink. And we don't need them. You all learnt to drink out of a, a sippy cup when you were, what, two? Maybe even less. So we don't need straws. You can get paper ones, wax paper, and that's what I want everyone to change to. Here's another one, letting balloons go. People do this as some kind of celebration. 70% of our, the surface of our planet is ocean, and the chances are these are going to end up inside the seabirds. Those shear waters that you saw, Almost all of them had little balloon ties in them, the little plastic bit that stops the air coming out. I've seen turtles with balloons being pulled out of their stomachs and other seabirds. So just think about it. You're literally littering the ocean. If you hear anyone say, yeah, we're going to let some balloons go, say, please don't, because it's just like pouring rubbish into the ocean. Now, one of the things that you can do is artwork. And I've been looking at the stuff you've done out there, and it's absolutely fantastic. And have it on display in the school, and when the other kids come up to you and say, what's this all about? You can tell them. This is one that was done in Hong Kong. It was, it was they created a wave, they even color-coded it so the deeper stuff was at the bottom. And they had it right in the center of the school atrium. And everybody started talking about plastic and recycling and cutting down on it. You can make posters, you can make t-shirt designs. This is a, a little girl I, I was teaching in Hong Kong recently. She'd made a turtle. 
and she just used the stuff that they, they'd brought in for their lunch. So then they start telling people about it. But think about it. We've got to wash up. You go for a picnic. You can either get bamboo cutlery or wooden cutlery, or best of all, take your own and wash it up when you get home. You don't need to buy water in bottles. You get beautiful water here. Even in developing countries, there's things you can do about it. When I was a kid, I lived in Singapore, and we couldn't drink the water out of the taps. So we used to just boil it and put it in the fridge. And that was fine, and I never got sick. So we're lucky here. We don't need to buy it. Just get a bottle and take it and refill it and take it before you go out. And my message is to you, don't throw away your future. I've been really lucky. I've seen this planet long before this plague of plastic hit it. And I'd love to think that you and my children and my grandchildren are going to see just as I did when I was young. What I'm going to do now is show you a short trailer for our film. And then if there's any questions, I'll do my very best to answer them. Thank you so much. Yeah. 